Welcome. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast, the show that cuts through the fog of war and updates you about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. With your host, Linnea Hubbard. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts. I'm Linnea Hubbard and today is Friday, January 27th, 2023. It's been 3,257 days since Russia occupied Crimea on February 27, 2014, and 338 days since the large-scale invasion of Ukraine began. Today's podcast looks at what happened yesterday in the Russia-Ukraine war. The Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War update is compiled by our team from around the world. Today's report includes information from direct contacts in Ukraine and their proxies, Russian Ministry of Defense reports, the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine reports, Operational Commands North, South, and East of Ukraine, Open Source Intelligence, our in-house team of analysts and geolocation experts, and pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian mill bloggers and social media accounts with a track record of trying to be accurate. We have one mission, to report the truth, because the truth matters. Let's start with our assessment of the current status of the war. First, we assess that the significant increase in disinformation and misinformation from Russian sources is being directed by Chief of the General Staff of the Russian Federation Armed Forces, Valery Gerasimov, as part of his hybrid warfare doctrine. Second, we maintain that Ukraine holds the battlefield initiative, except on the solidar bakhmut axis. Third, We maintain that the Russian military within Ukraine remains combat ineffective and is relying on World War II tactics that Field Marshal Georgi Zhukov would recognize to move the line of conflict. Fourth, we maintain that the power struggle between military leaders aligned with Russian Minister of Defense Sergei Shoigu versus those aligned with private military company or PMC Wagner Group head Yevgeny Prigozhin is continuing and Russian President Vladimir Putin is the largest benefactor. Fifth, we assess that punitive missile and drone strikes targeting civilians and civilian infrastructure will continue. The attacks on January 25th and 26th demonstrated that Ukrainian air defenses are becoming increasingly effective, achieving an 88% success rate. Sixth, we maintain that Russian forces will continue to target electrical, heating, and potable water infrastructure. Seventh, we assess that the Russian Federation's inventory of caliber cruise missiles is critically low, with the Black Sea Fleet launching fewer than 25 missiles from December 28th to January 27th. Eighth, we maintain that there is a risk of a nuclear accident caused by the de-energization of Ukrainian nuclear power plants as a result of Russian electrical infrastructure destruction. Ninth, We assess there will be a second wave of partial mobilization in the Russian Federation in February 2023 as an extension of current legal decrees, and has likely started after a statement made by Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov. And finally, we assess that the threat of Russian forces in Belarus crossing into Ukraine as part of an offensive operation is negligible. Let's get some regional updates, starting with the Donbass region in Luhansk. Russian and Ukrainian sources reported that fighting remained positional in nature along the entire axis. NASA Fire Information for Resource Management Systems, or FIRMS, showed a lot of thermal anomalies in the Russian-occupied gray areas, indicating that Ukrainian forces significantly increased artillery use. On the Svatova axis, positional battles continued around Novoselivsk, with no change in the situation. On the Kremina axis, artillery exchanges and positional fighting were reported in and near Ploshanka and Chervonopopivka, with mercenaries with Wargonzo reporting that Russian positions in Kremina were shelled. Positional fighting between squad and platoon-sized units supported by artillery continued in the areas of Dibrova, Kizmina, and the Serebriansky woods south of Kremina. The Luhansk People's Republic, or LNR, Joint Center for Control and Coordination, or JCCC, reported that three rockets fired by HIMARS struck Rubizhna yesterday. They also reported They also reported that three rockets fired by HIMARS struck Rubizhna yesterday. 
They also reported two additional rockets struck below Kurakne. Positional fighting continued near Bilohorivka, the one in Luhansk, with Wargonzo reporting that Russian units failed to move the line of conflict. In northeast Donetsk on the Siversk axis, Russian forces renewed efforts to advance on Verknokomyanskia from the oil refinery on the Luhansk-Donetsk administrative border, without success. Fighting also continued in the eastern regions of Spirna. Fighting continued in Bilohorivka, the one in Donetsk, with no change in the situation, though with an unconfirmed report that Russian forces made marginal gains. On the Solidar axis, Ukrainian forces maintained their defensive lines. PMC Wagner continued their attempts to advance on Rozdolivka from Krasnopolivka without success, while fighting continued near Blahodatne and Krasnohora. Russian sources provided very little information about results or progress on the axis. On the Bakhmut axis, fighting continued on the city's eastern and southern edges. Russian and Ukrainian sources were aligned in reporting there were no significant changes. We reviewed intelligence yesterday that Ukrainian forces had pushed south from Bakhmut toward Opitne and shared a Russian state media report. NASA firms showed a thermal anomaly in southern Opitne, supporting the reports of a limited Ukrainian operation to push PMC Wagner back. South of Bakhmut, there continues to be a bit of an information vacuum about the situation west of Klishivka. Eight days after PMC Wagner claimed they captured the village, still no pictures or videos have been shared. Russian reports on January 24th and 25th of a breakthrough west and south of the settlement were false, although the situation is very difficult for Ukrainian forces. NASA firm's data indicated that Ukrainian forces heavily shelled Kurdyumivka, supporting a January 25th war gonzo report. In southwest Donetsk, no significant fighting on the New York or Avdiivka axes was reported, and artillery fire was sporadic. Fighting continued in Marinka, with Russian sources making unsubstantiated claims that Ukrainian forces were pushed out of the downtown area. On the Vuladar axis, the Russian Ministry of Defense, or MOD, only reported artillery shelling of Ukrainian positions, while mercenaries with Rybar reported fighting continued in the dachas between Mikilska and Pavlivka. The General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, or GSAFU, reported that Ukrainian forces successfully defended Vuladar and Pavlivka. Russian mill bloggers claimed that the ground lines of communication, called GLOX, those are supply lines, into Vuladar were under Russian fire control, while simultaneously claiming that Ukrainian reinforcements and military equipment were arriving in the settlement. Those two things are mutually exclusive, and cannot happen concurrently. Also, there's no evidence that the area is in a technical encirclement. On the contrary, videos indicate that things aren't going well for Russian forces, suffering significant losses of armored vehicles for the second day in a row. Weather conditions are expected to deteriorate significantly over the weekend, which could complicate Russian offensive operations. Southwest of Mariupol, insurgents reported that a fresh group of Mobiks from Moscow arrived in Yalta, while damaged Russian military equipment passed through the city from the Zaporizhia direction, headed toward Ferelzy's actual Russia. Moving on to Kherson and Zaporizhia. There was mutual shelling on both sides of the Dnipro in Kherson, with Russian forces firing 36 times into free Ukraine, with five strikes on the city of Kherson, wounding five people. Shelling continued in Russian-occupied Novokhovka. The International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, reported there were eight explosions close to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant on January 25th, around 10 hundred hours local time. IAEA monitors added that the sound of artillery fire had increased over the last week. IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi provided an update on ZNPP and confirmed the 330 and 750 kilovolt power lines that support the plant were not de-energized during Russia's cruise missile attack yesterday. Reactors 1 through 4 remain in cold shutdown, while reactors 5 and 6 are in hot shutdown to provide steam for plant operations and heat to Enerhodar. 
Grossi indicated that negotiations for the demilitarization of ZNPP continued, with his tone less optimistic than during the fall. Otherwise, artillery, rockets, and tank fire were exchanged from the Zaporizhia Donetsk administrative border to Huliapola, Orehiv, and west to Stepova. In the Black Sea, Crimea, Mykolaiv, and Odessa region, the yellow terrorism threat level in Sevastopol was extended to February 10th. The former deputy mayor of Sudok, Russian collaborator Ivaz Umerov, received a three-year sentence for, quote, abuse of office, in a Sevastopol courtroom. Umerov was accused of assaulting a city employee. On the Russian front, Marat Husnulin, deputy prime minister of the Russian Federation, stated repair work is continuing on the Kerch Strait Bridge. The span is scheduled to be closed on January 31st for potentially, quote, a few days for ongoing work to restore the westbound highway lanes. The bridge was disabled in the early morning hours of October 8th. The Kurt Strait Ferry was suspended yesterday due to poor weather. Let's talk about developments theater-wide and outside Ukraine. Ukrainian officials provided updated information about the drone and missile attacks on January 25th and 26th. Russia launched 59 cruise missiles, including nine caliber cruise missiles from the Black Sea Fleet, and a KH-55 nuclear-capable missile equipped with a dummy warhead. Three cruise missiles failed in flight and did not acquire their assigned target. Air defenses shot down 47 of the 56 possible targets. The number of Shahed-136 kamikaze drones was revised downward from 25 to 17, with air defense downing all 17 UAVs. The 88% success rate of Ukrainian air defenses was the best performance since the first wide-scale attack on October 10th. Four power facilities were damaged, one in Kyiv, two in Odessa, and one in Venetia. The Ukrainian military claimed to have destroyed a fifth 2S4 Tulip 240mm self-propelled mortar and second in 48 hours. In the video, which could not be geolocated, but which we do link to in our full situation report on Patreon, the 2S4 appeared to have been disabled and abandoned and became a target of opportunity for a drone. Today's update from the United Kingdom Ministry of Defense Defense Intelligence Directorate validates our recent trust issues, saying, quote, Over the last six days, Russian online commentators have claimed Russian forces have made significant advances, breaking through Ukrainian defenses in two areas, in Zaporizhia Oblast near Orekhiv and 100 kilometers to the east in Donetsk Oblast near Vuladar. Russian units have probably conducted local probing attacks near Orekhiv and Vuladar, but it is highly unlikely that Russia has actually achieved any substantive advances. There is a realistic possibility that Russian military sources are deliberately spreading misinformation in an effort to imply that the Russian operation is sustaining momentum. End quote. Speaking of misinformation, let's talk about Russian mobilization. PMC Wagner embraced equal opportunity in what we have to admit was a glorious post mocking the Kremlin and its numerous red lines regarding Western weapons in Ukraine, highlighting a multitude of statements between March 2022 and now that are, effectively, all bark and no bite. Most recently, on January 24th, Dmitry Polyansky, first deputy permanent representative of Russia to the United Nations, said, quote, We are sending more and more signals that some red lines have been crossed, but perhaps the reddest ones have not yet been crossed. End quote. All of those other lines were actually vermilion lines, so... The Russian MOD is reportedly considering sending a company-sized group of T-14 Armada tanks to Ukraine, apparently in response to Western military aid. The United Kingdom Ministry of Defense Defense Intelligence Directorate reported that the soldiers trained to operate and service the T-14 MBTs are refusing deployment because the build quality is so poor and there are so many technical issues. The T-14 debuted in 2014 and fewer than 15 operational examples are available. Up to 25 more are either hand-built prototypes or still being assembled. 
In geopolitical news, Spain has arrested a 74-year-old man in the northern city of Burgos, with officials accusing him of being the author of six letter bombs mailed in November and early December of 2022. Recipients included Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez and Madrid's Ukrainian and U.S. embassies. One device exploded, wounding a security official at the Ukrainian embassy in November. The suspect, who has not been named, is a Spanish citizen and is believed to have acted alone. The investigation is ongoing. Rasmus Paladin, who burned the Quran in Stockholm, kicking off a firestorm between Turkey, Sweden, and Finland over NATO membership, claims the political stunt wasn't his idea and was done in collaboration with right-wing populist activist Chang Frick, who is allegedly connected to the Kremlin. The Kremlin works with political extremes to sow discord as part of its hybrid warfare policies. In this case, it appears that all did go to plan. The United States requested Israel transfer its Cold War-era Hawk anti-aircraft missile system to Ukraine, with the Netanyahu government refusing, out of concern that it would anger the Kremlin. In economic news, Russians reported that the Apple App Store and Steam game site were not working anymore, even with a VPN. We cannot verify these reports. The American company International Paper, the largest foreign investor in the timber industry in Russia, has agreed to sell its assets in the Russian Federation. Owning a 50% stake in the Ilim Group, International Paper agreed to liquidate its stake to Russian partners for $484 million. French company Angenico, which makes credit and debit card payment terminals, is planning to withdraw from Russia at the end of February. Currently, the company holds a 50% market share. If they leave, the terminals will still work, but parts and repair services will no longer be available. The ruble was unchanged, with an official exchange rate of 69 for one U.S. dollar. Western oil prices increased, with WTI crude climbing to $82 a barrel and Brent reaching $89. Russian Ural's crude also ticked upward, reaching an official price of $59 a barrel. United States wholesale Arbob gasoline on the spot market was up $0.04 cents to $2.64 a gallon, or $0.70 cents a liter. Dutch TTF natural gas futures continued to drop, falling to 54 euros per megawatt hour for February and March 2023 delivery. Chicago SRW wheat futures climbed on the news that Russia was conducting a stealth blockage of Ukrainian grain shipments by refusing to inspect vessels. Over 100 ships are delayed, some for as long as 15 days, due to what Russia claims are, quote, staffing issues. The price closed at $7.50 a bushel for March 2023 delivery. And that's what we know. Join me again tomorrow for more updates. Until then, stay safe, everyone. You've been listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. To help keep us independent, please consider providing financial support by becoming a patron. Want on-demand news in your hand? Download the Google News app and make Malcontent News one of your favorites to receive breaking news updates. Thank you for listening.